My name is Renee Clark, and this lecture is over Chapter 1, The Way of the Program, from the Think Python eBook. We start the chapter looking at computer scientists and the goal of this textbook being to help you learn to become a computer scientist. Now, the most important skill you need as a computer scientist is to be a problem solver. And problem solving is a skill you may already have because we've all learned how to solve little problems in our lives. We start as babies. This book will help you develop more practical programming-oriented problem solving skills. Let's start with a discussion of what is a program. Now, a program is simply a set of instructions that specifies how to perform a computation. It could be something mathematical. It could be something more symbolic. It could be searching and replacing text. It could be something graphical oriented. But it's just a set of instructions. We have the normal things that you think of when you're thinking about computers. Input putting in things to into your computer, whether through a keyboard, a file, a network, some other device, displaying data on the screen or saving it to a file, sending it over a network. Usually some type of math is happening where you're performing some type of basic mathematical operation, something like addition or multiplication. Often you're doing this in conjunction with conditional execution. You're going to check for certain conditions and based on those conditions, you choose a course of action and run the appropriate cord code. This is often done repeatedly. There's a lot of repetition in programming, and we'll get into that further in later chapters. To run Python, they give you directions in this book about using the Python Anywhere in my classroom, we'll be using the Anaconda Python version of software. So use whichever you feel works best for you. My directions will all be tied into Anaconda so that you will need to either download it or figure out how to work with a different Python version of code. Now, a Python interpreter is simply a program that reads and executes Python code. Depending on your environment, you might start the interpreter by clicking and then typing Python on a command line. And what you see output could vary from what's shown here. Down here, you see this is what you might see when you start up. So, when using the Anaconda software, I go from my Start button to Anaconda. In this case, I'm going with a strict Anaconda inter inter interface, so command line. So I'm using Anaconda Prompt, and that's going to open up to another window like this one. Once I get here, I need to go ahead and type in Python. Then you'll see that my code now looks much like what's shown here, except that I'm not running on a Linux computer. I'm actually running on a Windows-based computer. So the first three lines up here, these guys, are about this version of the interpreter and the operating system. So it could be different. This example shows Python 3 version uh, 0.4. Mine is using Python 3.7.1. And the last thing, the fourth line, is the prompt. This is the three little arrows, and this is the prompt for Python. Here's where I can start typing in code to be run. A basic program could be printing out Hello World. So I'm going to type in print Hello world. And a closing parenthesis. I placed my hello world statement inside of single quotation marks. Once I press enter, because I'm in an interactive program, it immediately prints out my response, just like they're showing over here in the book. 
Now this book also gives some instructions related to Python 2. I'll be ignoring those for the purposes of this lecture. We can also do arithmetic operators and basic addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Here are some examples, 40 plus, and so I'm going back over to my Anaconda prompt window where I'm running my Python. 40 plus 2 gets me 42, 43 minus 1. You'll notice I've left blank spaces in some and not in others. It's a bit insensitive to blank spaces in these examples, but there are places where spacing will make a big difference, and we'll learn about those as we go along. 6 times 7. And then how about some subtract or division here? So we're going to put 84 divided by 2. Now you'll notice that the first three gave us 42 as an integer. The last one gives us 42.0, indicating it is a float, meaning it has a decimal place in it. And that happens when we're using um, division. We'll talk more about the types of variables later on. We can also do exponentiation. So 6 and using the 2 asterisks to the power of 2 plus 6 will get me 42. So next let's look at values and types. So a value is one of the basic things in your program, and it can be a letter or a number. We've seen things like 2, 42.0, and hello world so far. These values belong to different types. We have the integer type, which the 2 is an integer. We have a floating point, which is 42. So that's a floating point number. Some people might refer to it as a decimal number. And then we have a string, which was our hello world. You can look at the type of a value by asking the interpreter to tell you. If I type in at my command line over here in my window, and I say type, and I put in parentheses the number 2, it will tell me that that is a class integer. If I put type 42.0, it's going to tell me that's a float, and type Hello world is going to come back as a string. So you can see we have different types of variables here. So we can use strings, integers, and floating points. And we'll be using these throughout the course. Something to keep in mind when you're typing larger numbers. When you're typing a large number, normally you might put, if you were typing a million, you might put in commas to separate. In Python, that's not a legal integer. And what that will get you is something different than what you expect. It will turn it into some lists, not at all what you expect. So if you're typing a number that is to be an integer in Python, even if it's very large, do not put the commas in to separate. Keep in mind, there are formal and natural languages. The natural languages are the languages that people speak, such as English, Spanish, French, etc. Many people in my classes speak other languages than English. These were not designed specifically by people. They just kind of evolved naturally. Now, we also have formal languages. These are ones that are designed by people for a specific application. Uh, notation that mathematicians use, um, chemists use the chemical structure of molecules. Well, programming languages are also formal languages that have been designed to express computations. As a result, they tend to have very strict syntax rules in formal languages. So you might see in math that you have to do 3 plus 3 equals 6. That's the correct syntax. If you put in a dollar sign in there like they've done here, that doesn't really work. It's not going to figure it out. In chemistry, H2O for water, very easy to understand. 
but if you put things in a different order and move that number in front instead of behind, it doesn't understand it. So these are things that you have to remember. Python is very formal. It, formal. it has very strict syntax rules. These rules come in two flavors, according to our book, tokens and structure. Tokens are going to be the basic elements of your language, the words, the numbers, the chemical elements in the examples we've looked at so far. While the second syntax rules relate to how the tokens are used and combined, putting them in the wrong order is a structural issue, not an issue with the actual token itself. Here's an example they give that I think demonstrates this well. This is a well-structured English sentence with invalid tokens. I've highlighted it there. Most of us can look at that and our brains can interpret it, even though it's not properly written. There's some misspellings, inappropriate uses of an at symbol and an asterisk and a dollar sign, but our brains are able to interpret it because the English language is pretty ambiguous and informal. You know, our brains go out there and they look at it and they parse that, they process it. So that's some, uh, one of the differences between formal and informal. That type of structure using Python commands would not work. So common differences between the way you handle formal and natural languages. One, ambiguity. The natural language is full of ambiguity. There's all sorts of things that are said that are very ambiguous, and people still understand each other. Part of what helps them understand each other is the use of redundancy. In order to make it more clear what you're trying to say, you will often repeat yourself or say something in a slightly different way to get your point across. Other times, there's a literalness to natural languages. They're full of what are known as idioms and metaphors, where you'll say something and everybody can understand what you mean generally, but in fact, it doesn't make any sense. For example, the penny dropped. You know, there's no penny involved. There's nothing that gets dropped. It's just a manner of saying that, oh, somebody finally figured out what was really going on, what's the point that was trying to be made. And there's a lot of that in our languages. We all grow up speaking some type of a natural language. In poetry, words are used for their sound as well as their meaning. You might be doing a rhyming poem, and so you're using a word that will rhyme with something else. In prose, it's more important literally what the word means, not so much does it sound right, what is it, does it uh, rhyme. In programming, the meaning of the computer program is very unambiguous and it's very literal, and it can be entirely understood by analyzing the tokens and the structures. Next, let's talk about debugging. Programmers make mistakes, and they say in here for whimsical reasons, the programming errors are called bugs, and the process of tracking them down is called debugging. One of the most commonly believed stories regarding the term bug is that it comes from a actual bug, a moth, getting into a computer and causing the computer to stop running because it interfered with the electronics. Hence, any kind of programming error uh, that makes a, you know, makes a program stop running is now referred to as a bug. And so debugging is the process of trying to figure out what is wrong and fixing that. Now, this can be a very frustrating type of event. When you first start programming, you'll look at something and you're trying to figure out why. One of the most important things is to pay close attention to your error messages and it will make much more sense. But it's a skill that you will learn along with programming. This chapter includes several glossary terms. Some of these are used throughout the text and this just reinforces the understanding and meaning. Others are new and were not used in the chapter, but they are important terms, so make sure you have read the glossary and understand the terms as well. If you have any questions, please consult your instructor.